Well, hello everyone. Welcome to YouTube channel. I'm your host for this evening. My name's Erin Henderson. I am the founder and chief sommelier at the Wine Sisters located here in beautiful and very muggy Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Tonight is one of my favorite topics, the good German girl that I am. We are talking all about wines of Germany. So do please pour yourself a crisp, clean glass of beautiful German Riesling, but please do so responsibly. And from the LCBO and our trade partners, we want to remind you that if you enjoy any of these wines tonight or any enjoy any of the wines at all, that they are all available for home delivery now as well. They also are available for same day pickup, which is a service I personally have really loved from the LCBO. So do enjoy responsibly as we move through it. And let me introduce to you without further ado, my colleague for this evening and my co-host, Ms. Kimberly Pollock. Hello, my dear. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for having me tonight. How are you? I am absolutely great. I'm getting a little bit thirsty. But before we dive in, can you tell me and everybody who's tuning in where a little bit about yourself? What, what's up with you? You're a certified sommelier, but anything else we need to know? Sure. Um, so I'm working right now as a manager and the fine buyer sommelier at a new restaurant called Azar. Uh, it's on Ossington Avenue, very uh, northern Mediterranean inspired Um so a really great place to be buying wine for a lot of German wines work incredibly and surprisingly well with these foods. Oh, terrific. Okay. Well, I think we did get them started about a minute late. So what I'd love to be able to do is dive right in. Um, I think it's only appropriate that we dive in with Germany's calling card, at least how we understand it here in North America. I think it's important that we dive in with a Riesling. And so where are we headed? Where are we going? Uh, let's start with uh, with a wine from the Mosul. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of regions in Germany, but I think if people know one, it's going to be the Mosul. Uh, it is pretty iconic, especially when it comes to those Rieslings. Oh, of course it is. And look at this bottle that we're starting off with first. Like this one, relax Riesling. Like, first of all, relax. Like, could we not do this any better? Uh, I actually, interestingly enough, just hosted an, a virtual sangria event with relax red blend uh and it was absolutely fabulous but this one here uh relax it's uh under 12 dollars at the lcbo again available for home delivery or same day pickup so that's just a deal right there how fabulous is this tell me everything you need tell me everything kimberly tell me everything you know well uh, i you know i love this wine so much i think that the label is iconic i'm so happy to see kind of the development and the modernization of these labels from germany uh, making them incredibly consumer friendly, um, really easy to read and understand. Um, but the wine inside, you can always be guaranteed, it still has those iconic Mosul characters. Um, you know, the steep slopes, the slate soils, um, they create this minerality that is inescapable in these wines, it really defines them. Well, we're looking at pictures right now of the Mosul, and really, this is the fairy tale that you are expecting. You're expecting to see the Brothers Grimm go tiptoeing out of the tiptoeing out of those vineyards. Like, look how incredibly steep they are. Like those those ain't machine harvested. I'll tell you that much. Those are precariously steep slopes, absolutely staggering. And I like that you brought up the Mosul and the slate uh, soil of that. Even for your most introductory wine lover, that slate so soil is, say that three times fast. Wow, that slate soil is so integral to the, um, to the overall texture and feeling and flavor and aromatic of the wine. We're seeing a picture of that slate right now. Interestingly, on those slopes, sometimes in that spring runoff, the slate will actually tumble down the hill, so I'm told, and be left to physically pick it up and bring it back up the mountain or the foothill because it's so integral to make sure that it stays there, which is incredible. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, I mean, those slopes are so steep. I've heard of people having to be harnessed in while they're working there just for, for safety's sake. Um, so really um, a really intense place to work that creates these really beautiful ethereal wines. Well, and that's exactly it. Whatever you, you know, if it's worth it, it's worth working for. So, you know, and this nose really, to me, we're getting that very characteristic Riesling. Now we've got some of that beautiful lemon lime. We've of course got that slate and on the palate, Mm. on the palate woo, got that beautiful axe precision of acidity right that arrowhead that angular uh acidity but there is a little bit of residual sweetness here and i'd love to just 
get that elephant out of the room right away and let's talk about that for a second. Sweetness and Riesling. Tell so me. It's interesting. I think some people are afraid uh, when it comes to sweetness and Riesling. Uh, when I'm talking to guests or even friends about a Riesling, I always feel like I need to, to use a disclaimer about how sweet or unsweet it is. Um, but really what it comes down to is that the sugar in these wines is a balancing factor. Um, they, uh, because it's so hard to grow these grapes, sometimes it's harder for them to ripen. Um, they retain so much freshness. Um, that, that sweetness there just really makes it um, more delicious, more pleasurable. Um, you know, just think about, think about your lemonade. What would, what would that lemon juice be without a little bit of sugar to balance it out? Exactly. And you know what, this one has like, this one, if you're taking a sip of it, if you're having this relaxed Riesling, um, I absolutely think it's, it's absolutely great because yeah, you're getting a bit of sweetness, but you're getting that, you know, that beautiful acidity, that saliva under the tongue, that cheek pinching, bum clenching, like what? I'm awake now better than a strong cup of coffee in the morning like hello uh, and but what's really great about it as well is when you get that acidity it loans itself to a ton of food pairings which is amazing right because you have all of that um, well that saliva that's happening in your mouth it cleanses your palate gets you ready for the next bite and our friends at food and drink magazine have put together a beautiful pairing here. This one's a Scandinavian smoked salmon with fresh dill strata. Mm. Elegante. If that's not elegante, I don't know what is. And if you're watching this, you can go to the foodanddrink.com, not now, after this stream is over, go to foodanddrink.com, search for these recipes, and they will be available at your fingertips. But Maybe. really lovely wine, don't you think? It's so lovely. And I really appreciate the fact that it's lower alcohol. It's just 9%. Uh, and this makes it incredibly um, kind of crushable um, for any time. I like that you bring that up because low alcohol and no alcohol is very on trend these days for obvious reasons, whether that's lifestyle, cultural, just preferential, whatever your situation might be. And if it's, it's to my understanding, and I think the LCBO itself is rolling out in certain stores, you're starting to see entire sections dedicated to low alk and no alk wine, which is really great. And for me, uh, for example, I'll be going away this weekend uh, this is the long weekend in Ontario, and I do believe it's the long weekend in most parts of Canada. The August long weekend, that is the, do I hear the loons of the cottage calling? I think I do. So when I go and head up there, you know, yes, of course, we're going to be relaxing on the balcony, but I want to stay foxy. I want to stay fresh. I want to stay fabulous. I don't want to be passed out on the couch at seven o'clock at night. So when we have these daytime sippers, Brilliant on the back deck with some charcuterie, some cheese, you know, a turkey burger, whatever the case might be. These lower alcohol wines help you get through that marathon of a day, as they like to say these days are marathons, not sprints when it comes to eating and drinking. So pace yourself accordingly. Um, okay, so that was the Mosul. Probably uh, one more on the Mosul. Pardon me? One more wine from the Mosul. Do we? Tell me everything. Where are we going now? What are we drinking? Okay, this one gets a little bit more specific. So this is Mosel Land's Bernkastler Kripsle. Uh, and so that is a- fast. Can you do that? Can you say that three times fast? Let me try. Uh, Bernkastler Kripsle, Bernkastler Kripsle, Bernkastler Kripsle. Good Lord, you get a prize for that. Um, okay, so my first question to you then, when we're talking about Mosel Land and the Bernkastler Kripsle, um, what the heck does that mean? That's a completely fair question. I think um, as excited as we were to see the modernization of the Relax Reasons label, uh, this is a little bit more on the traditional side of how they label things. Um, essentially, uh, this one just tells you about a more specific place. So Bern Castle is a city in Germany. And um, in German, they use the ER at the end of a word the same way we would apostrophe S to show a possessive. And so this is the Kaferstle Vineyard, which is part of the city of Berncastle. Ich bin ein Berliner. <laughs> exactly. If you are uh, wondering what the heck I'm talking about, and I don't blame you because I usually wonder what the heck I'm talking about, that was that famous um, JFK speech where he ended up inadvertently calling himself a donut to the entire city of Berlin and the entire country of Germany, because to say that is grammatically not correct. It's literally translated into like into English. It makes sense. But when it's translated, it kind of misses the mark a little bit because you do say you do toss that ER on for people who are from. But anyway, I'm getting derailed. I'm getting derailed already. I'm only two mm -hmm. Rieslings in and already I'm wearing my dirndl. 
Anyway, so what I love about this, yeah, what you were saying and the Baron Kessler, this one already, it's still from the Mosul. And how cool is this? Two different tastes. So initially we were tasting the Relax Riesling, very, even though it's a 200 year old winery, this particular brand, very modern in style and uh, very stylish, very clean, very um, uh, forward in terms of its bottle design. But now we're doing something that's a little bit more traditional, like you said, and, and amazing because even though they're the same place, they're the same grape, there is a distinct difference in the style. And that of course loans itself to the winemaker's toolkit amongst other things like vineyard uh, positioning. Tell me more about how that can possibly be. Same grape, same region, but really totally different styles. Um, I think, you know, we talked a little bit about that slate soil and uh, I think it kind of comes down to a little bit um, something that relates to that here. So there, there is slate all over the Mosul, but the amount and the kind of slate changes. And so when you change from a kind of a generic wine that's blending grapes from a few different locations into a specific single vineyard site, you're narrowing in on one single soil. And so it emphasizes part of the wine. So you get some of the same characteristics, um, but really a, a little bit more intensity and a real point of view. And it's gorgeous. It really is. I, I think that's fantastic. Again, that beautiful mouth watering, once again, loaning itself to all kinds of uh, food flexibility. And our good friends at Food and Drink Magazine, with their brilliant minds, their brilliant palettes, they've gone a totally different direction, which just shows and proves how awesome Riesling can be with a swath of different flavors. Here we're going with Asian green salad. It has some grilled tofu, miso dressing. Can I tell you how much I've been loving miso these days? Miso, I've been on a miso bender. Uh, and soy glazed sesame seeds. That sounds really labor intensive, but if you want the recipe, you can go to foodanddrink.com and get it for yourself and try to glaze your own sesame seeds. But uh, I love that because I think that Riesling is a natural go-to. It's your get out of jail free card when you're pairing it with these really complex and flavorful Asian uh, flavors. Absolutely, especially ones that have all those umami characters like the miso and the sesame. Um, you really need a wine that kind of, you know, like really responds well to those things and kind of amplifies all the flavor in the dish. Oh, super delish. I'm really excited. Um, what do you want to do next? Shall we stick with Riesling? Um, let's stick with Riesling, but let's try, let's try one from a different place. Let's uh, head a little bit further south. Rheinhessen. Okay, so for people who are looking at the map, you can see the Rheinhessen is uh, almost in the center of that southwestern whole wine region. It's beside the Nahe, which is in yellow. It's above the False, which is in brown. And the Rheinhessen is this beautiful um, turquoise character. But okay, Kimberly, Ms. Sommelier extraordinaire, you've already stumped me. I think Rheinhessen, we were just talking about the Mosul, uh, I think if anybody thinks about Germany and its wine regions at all, they probably would only think about the Mosul. And you're telling me, and we're showing here, that there's more than one region? Yeah, I think um, so many times wines of Germany are all lumped in together and, um, you know, you think of just one style. But there are, there are a number of regions there. There are, there are 13 wine regions in Germany in total, and they're all known for different grapes. Um, they all have slightly different climates. Um, very different soils. And so what you can get across the country is a real diversity of styles of wine. You, you really can. And what I love there about those gorgeous pictures that we were seeing, on one hand, we saw that first picture of the Rheinhessen, which is lush and green, and it makes me want to sing this, you know, the hills are alive with the sound of music. Um, but then on that flip side, that second photo, we saw how advanced and how modern um, uh, Rheinhessen actually is with those windmills like that's that seems almost industrial don't you think uh you know it, it feels that way a bit but really they're just really taking advantage of the fact that the Rheinhessen is a little bit of a flatter area compared to the Mosul um some rolling hills um but really good wind kind of blows across that area and so what they can do is take advantage of this natural wind resource um to create energy for the area is there anything the Germans cannot do like seriously the Germans have just about nailed everything. It makes me feel like a massive underachiever, massive underachiever. That's why I need to have another glass of Riesling. Uh, if you're just tuning in right now, thank you for joining us. My name's Erin Henderson. I'm the founder and the chief sommelier at the Wine Sisters located here in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. But of course, via the beauty of the internet, we go anywhere in the world. And I'm here with my colleague, sommelier Kimberly Pollock. We want to thank you for joining us, but also on the behalf of the LCBO and our trade partners, please do enjoy responsibly. And if you do pick up something that you want to try out on today's tasting of the wines of Germany, 
Remember, you can now get wines ordered directly to your home in Ontario, of course, uh, from the LCBO. And you can also try curbside pickup. And I have to tell you, curbside pickup is the bomb. The LCBO has really nailed this service. I love it. I just order what I need in the morning and it's generally ready by the afternoon. You get a little email, you go to your, it's just, it's perfect. I love it. It's just in, it's out. But also that now that they've done that home delivery, when you live on the 12th floor of a condo building like I do, hey, if somebody else is going to lug that case up the stairs, I'm okay with that. I am so okay with that. Yeah, it's an amazing opportunity to, to get Riesling right to your door. It's a good time to be alive. So I want to talk about this. This is so cool. This uh, Riesling from Dinehard, beautiful bottle. They've obviously uh, consulted a few graphic designers and artists. Look how forward uh, thinking the modern design. We're going back to that again. Back in the day, of course, I think one of the reasons why wine lovers and consumers, at least in Ontario and certainly in North America, uh, had a tendency to tiptoe away from Germany is that it got a little confusing for them. We were talking about that. You know, there was umlauts all over the place. There was that swirly curly cue calligraphy, generally a sketch of a church or something on there. And people didn't really understand what they were getting. And when people don't understand, they move away from that. But the Germans being as perfunctory as they are, um, I think that they're really helping the North Americans embrace and understand what's in the bottle. They've even dropped their own language by putting English on there. Instead of saying trucken, it says dry right on that label. So it's dispelling any, um, any myths. You know, you've got your Riesling, but this is a dry Riesling. So telling you right away, this is not sweet. It's dry. Uh, and then they're even going away. You know, this one, yes, we've just discussed it's from the Rheinhessen, but you really have to search to find where it says Rheinhessen. They're not putting all of that information up front. And to be quite frank, if you're somebody like me over the, the over 40 set, I just got a pair of progressives, my first ones. I'm a very, very progressive person. Uh, I can barely see where it is. So, hey, but I can see that beautiful lion. Yeah, I think this bottle labeling is really smart because it tells you everything you need to know and it doesn't overwhelm you with a bunch of words in a language that are, you know, a little bit, um, a little bit harder to understand. I think it's, you know, there's, you know, French is different in Canada. We, uh, everyone has a little bit of experience with that, but German is, is really not for everybody. Exactly. But what's great about it, again, we've, we're talking about a Riesling, it's our third Riesling in the tasting now. This one this one to me comes across as probably the most chalky, the most minerally, the most um, stony of them. And the, the fruit that's coming through is definitely more in that sort of uh, lemon lime. It, 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 it does deliver on what it promises on the label. Very, very dry. Mm -hmm. I think the dryness is really beautiful here because it, it gives the wine almost broader shoulders. Um, it's yeah. a stronger, kind of more powerful wine. I think that's kind of a combination of the, the dryness of the, the style. Um, and also the fact that the climate here is a little bit warmer. And so you get just a little bit more power. Okay. I really want to talk about that because most people, if they think about climates in uh, wi the wine world at all, we'll just get a slight bit nerdy. We'll get a little bit wine nerdy here. Um, when we're ba breaking down climates, we have warm climates, places that you might consider to be Australia, South Africa, California, something like that. And then you have cool climates. Ontario is certainly in that category as well as Germany. Uh, New Zealand, that's another category of the cool climate, but very interesting that cool climate was great about that. Cool climates have a tendency to struggle to ripen their grapes, and that may sound like a negative, but it's actually a positive. What does that mean for the grapes? It means that you get that brighter acidity, you get lower alcohol, and you get a real finessed wine with some real leanness and some real structure. In fact, even warm climates are trying to emulate that uh, cool climate style. Now, I think it's cool though, because ha, get it? I think it's cool. Uh, because even in a, even in Germany, which is generally speaking, cool climate, you do get these warmer microclimates, these warmer pockets, which then directly translates into that terroir and directly translates into what's in the glass. Absolutely. I think um, it's often overlooked in Germany because again, we're looking at a country that, that, you know, people are only thinking of one thing from, and that's such a, a mistake because you're missing out on uh, the regions that are taking advantage of this warmth uh, and these kind of more fertile soils um, who are actually, you know, growing a lot of red wine as well. Red wines, red wines, Germany? <laughs> you, you, surely you jest. Absolutely not. It's one of the most exciting kind of categories of wine there right now, just to see the diversity and the changing uh, of the climate. 
I want to get into that in one second, but first I want to show you the dynamic pairing that Food and Drink Magazine has come up for us. This, hey, happy Oktoberfest. We have got a brat on a bun with some purple sauerkraut, which I'm all in. I have to tell you, when I was living in Germany, um, I went to high school in Germany, and one of my favorite snacks on the way home from school, weirdly, um, it's this little, like a little Kaiser bun or a hamburger bun, and then they had these two narrow wieners that were very long and about the width of a pen maybe a bit wider and they stuck out like a six inches on either side of this bun but it was like two euro and actually I think they were even using uh Deutsche Marks when I was there oh god I'm old but anyway the point was it was super cheap it was super delicious weird geography of the actual you know the apparatus and the design of the hamburger slash sausage situation but delicious. And I, that would go that, that richness, fattiness of the sausage with that palate cleansing, uh, Riesling. Brilliant. Yeah. I think it's again, like an unsurprised, or sorry, a surprising pairing, but a really effective one when you can use, um, kind of white wines, Rieslings in particular, um, with meat, uh, because oftentimes it's a delicious pairing, just one that people don't really think about. Yeah, they don't. And it's great. It's really, but when you get those richer, fattier meats and you pair a nice, uh, you know, again, that arrowhead acidity of a beautiful raising with it, it's really making me hungry, actually. It's really, we got to stop. We got to move on to the red before I start literally drooling, because I'm about to, the combination of uh, my brighter Riesling and talking about all this great food from Food and Drink Magazine, I will lose my mind and I will just run off to the kitchen and leave you all by yourself. So you were saying that exciting things in the world of red wine from Germany, I would put money on it, that most people would be surprised to hear that Germany has any red wine. Yeah, I think um, this is a great example, a great entry point into those German red styles, um, because what we have here is a blend of the two most important red grapes in the country, the two most planted. It is. Um, okay. so this is Dornfelder and Pinot Noir. Now, I think most of us wine lovers will have a handle on Pinot Noir. Of course, this is going to be a lighter red grape, uh, thinner skinned. So we have, generally speaking, a ruby red, uh, slightly more uh, transparent wine, typically lower in tannins. Tannins are those things that have a leave you with a physical sensation in your mouth, like you've just, you know, walked away from the dentist with a mouthful of cotton balls, or your lips can stick to your teeth. Also, it offers some bitterness and some astringency in terms of flavor. But uh, but and then you get that tartar, brighter red fruit. But that's Pinot Noir. Great. Dornfelder? I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure. Dornfelder. Can you tell me, talk, walk me through the Dornfelder. Uh, so Dornfelder is a, a much more um, recent grape. It was only um, created bred in the 1950s. Uh, and so it has a lot less history than Pinot Noir does. Um, but it is really popular for blending because it can add a little bit more color to wines. Uh, it has kind of naturally thicker skins with more pig, uh, pigment to them. Uh, and so in blends with Pinot Noir, you get something a little bit more luscious, a little bit more full, uh, and something that focuses more on that darker, maybe spicy fruit character. This is done in a really modern style, right? And funny, a modern style coming from Black Tower, which is such, uh, tugs on the heartstrings of everybody because it's such a, a pioneering wine from Germany that if you're living in Ontario, certainly you've known about for decades, but Black Tower bringing sexy back with a really robust red. So what I love here is that we've got this beautiful balance between that tart and that bright sort of red cherry, cranberry, red currant kind of note of the Pinot Noir, but we've also got a plushness thanks to that Dornfelder. Um, obviously there's a little bit of a, a gentle kiss of oak here where we're getting a little bit more of, um, uh, of that riper berry and a little bit more of that uh, uh, baking spice kind of note uh, and a beautiful sort of purpley color, violet color that's shining through in this glass. I think, I think this would be a winner if I were to chill it down a little bit, which I have, but let me ask you this. What do you think about where summer it's, we're talking about right now, you and I are both located in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and it's just approaching August. And this summer, good Lord, this summer has been muggy and steamy and humid because it's poured for three days. And then that rain hasn't cleared out any of that humidity. It's just intensified it. So either way, you're completely drenched all the time. But sitting on your back porch or sitting at the cottage, you know, nice cheese plate, charcuterie plate, maybe a roast beef sandwich, whatever the case might be. I'm, I'm gonna say I'm, I'm putting this in an ice bucket for 10 minutes, but what's your feeling on chilling red wines? Yay or nay? 
I completely agree with it. I'm a huge fan. Um, I always make sure when I'm serving wine in restaurants and, you know, at home just to throw something in a fridge or just keep it at a bit of a lower temperature from room temperature. Um, because, you know, the temperature of rooms fluctuates and serving wine 20 plus degrees um, limits the, uh, the finesse you get out of them. I find when you chill something down, just, just the reds a little bit, um, you kind of hide the heat of the alcohol. And what you get is all of those great aromatics that the winemaker wants you to experience. Exactly. Now, what we're not saying is throw a bunch of ice cubes in your red wine or chill it down within an inch of your li of its life. If you end up, we actually have this really cool tasting uh, that I do with the wine sisters, but we compare the same bottle, one chilled, very, very cold and one served, you know, room temperature, slightly below room temperature. And conversely, uh, too warm, but conversely, when it's too cold, um, it actually ends up clamping down and muting all of those aromatics and flavors. So you're, all you're getting left is that sort of structure of the wine, which when it's mixed with flavor is great, but on its own, all you've got is the sour acid or the astringent tannin, and it's not very pleasant. Now, I also want to preface this as everyone's welcome at my wine table, so you do you, but I think it's really important that, um, you know, this is an educational video. So just, I think ice bucket for 10 minutes and you're set. Yeah. And I mean, if you're, if you're curious at home, try to just chill a glass down while you're drinking another one, have them side by side after and see which one you prefer. Oh, that's a really good tip, Kimberly. I like that one a lot. That way you don't have to necessarily invest in both bottles, but these are so inexpensive. You could invest in a whole case and still have loads of money left over. Um, this one though, I was talking about thinking about pairing it with roast beef sandwiches, some nice charcuterie. This could even go well with like your cedar plank or your smoked salmon could go really nicely. Um, let's see what the food and drink magazine has decided would work well here. Ooh, la, 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 tacos. And it's not even Tuesday. We've got beef bulgogi soft tacos, saucy, sweet, spicy. I'm in. Yeah, I love that a little bit of that spicy sauce to go with a really juicy wine like this, um, because you get all that, that fruit character to balance that out. Um, and so it's a really dynamic pairing idea. It is a really good one. I am a big fan of that. And I like how we're also sort of mixing a little bit of cultures. We're mixing a little bit of, uh, I think that that's really great. I should let everyone at home know if you're tuning in and enjoying this episode, but you have a couple questions or you have a few comments, please do type in and let us know what you're thinking or any of your questions and we will endeavor to answer them to the best of our ability. Similarly, if you're watching this on replay, fear not, we do check in from time to time after this has already been posted. Uh, Kimberly and I will be checking in as well as our uh, ever present and ever industrious LCBO team. So do make sure you leave your questions and comments and we will get back to you ASAP. But let's move along to our next wine, Kimberly, and where are we headed? Uh, so we're going a little bit further south again. We're heading uh, to, the, um, to the region of Baden. Baden? Okay, so let me tell you this. We were talking earlier about cool climate versus warm climate. And look at Baden. Is Baden a show off or what? Like, look at these beautiful tiered slopes, the lush greenness. But I think what a lot of people would be surprised to know is that, of course, we just said, and you saw that on the map, Baden so far south. But I mean, come on, come on, stop it, Baden, stop it. Um, what's really great about Baden is that it actually is warm enough to ripen and grow lemon trees, fig trees. It's, it's a warm climate place to be. Yeah, it's always been a popular spot in Germany for, for red wines, for different styles of grapes. Riesling, of course, here as well. Um, but you get so much more than that growing along with those and those fertile hills. Yes, but we're not doing Riesling. We're not doing red wine. We're doing something else. We're doing Gewürztraminer. The wine that will since the wine that will strike fear in the hearts of spelling bee contestants everywhere, Gewürztraminer from Baden. Hello. I think, you know, it's funny for me because I think that a lot of people will compare Gewürztraminer and Riesling and lump them into the same category, which yes, they're both aromatics, but that's to me where the comparison ends. I don't think that there's much, I mean, they're white wine, they come in the same shape bottle, they're aromatic wines, but I think worlds apart. I agree. I think that the structure of these wines, of these wines really sets them apart. Um, Riesling being defined by that, that freshness, that lightness. Uh, Gewürztraminer is almost opposite to that. 
right? It is um, a, a more full bodied style of wine, uh, generally has a little bit more, more texture uh, and really doesn't reach the same acidity kind of freshness levels that a Riesling ever can. No, uh, for sure not. Now Riesling of course, or acidity of course exists in all wines to a little or to a, a bigger degree. You need that, it's an integral component, but Gewürztraminer to me offers, I like that you say spice, like for me, I always get a ton of florality, like the rose petals, the lychee notes. You might even get some kind of peachy or for lack of a better descriptor, even a bit of a grapey note, but there is that kind of fatness on the palate. There is that perfume element on the aromatics. Um, this is actually why when you have such an intensely flavored, like this is like the opera singer of wines, like it just really, you know, bosoms out, everything's out, it's just so great. Um, but this is why you see a lot of Gewürztraminers on these uh, restaurant menus that have full flavored dishes. So brilliant with Indian food, brilliant with uh, Szechuan food, brilliant with, you know, spicy Thai, uh, even certain Mexican dishes it can go really well with. And what's nice about the Gewürztraminer, because Gewürztraminer can also tiptoe into that slightly off dry category and have all of that round fruitiness, uh, it helps temper some of those more spicy dishes. Absolutely. Uh, I think um, these wines are, are really special. And again, like something that's a little bit overlooked um, for those pairing opportunities. Um, but there is an opulence here, a plushness um, that really does stand up to things that have a lot of character themselves. Oh, I want to just take, did you see my napkin? Can you see this? I love that so much. Where did you find those? I got these from Wines of Germany because Wines of Germany is lovely and they always have these really cool things. And so I have these uh, napkins left over from an event that I did with them uh, not too long ago. So it's pretty cool. All the, all the varietals that are grown, the varieties that are grown in, uh, in Germany, which is super fun. So it's a, it's a great little thing to bring out for a dinner party because, you know, then it, it's, it's just a talking point and that's, that's what makes dinner parties kind of fun. Um, so after, so back to the wine, no longer about me. Uh, we were talking about like, yeah, the flavor and the food pairings. And I love what food and drink is put together for this food pairing. It's so great for summer. We've got Vietnamese chicken rolls. So uh, of course, this hits all kinds of current and trendy notes. So we're looking at lettuce wraps, okay? So if you're not doing carbs, certainly not me, I love carbs, but if you're not doing carbs, it's there for you. If you uh, are interested in having something just refreshing and easy going for your hot, muggy, steamy, sweaty, you know, summer days, it's there for you. And that is mwah like absolutely beautiful with a Gewürztraminer. Absolutely fantastic. You can find that recipe on foodanddrink.com. Yeah, I can't wait to look that one up. I love, you know, all those like great fresh herbal qualities with the Gewürztraminer matching that spiciness. Um, I think they would really complement each other in all the perfect ways. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Fantastic. We have gone through five wines already. Can you believe it? It's amazing. We're just big drinkers. Just kidding. We're not big drinkers. Well, well, that you can be the judge of that. But I should remind you as we move into our final and our sixth wine of this tasting, my name's Erin Henderson. I am the uh, founder and chief sommelier at the Wine Sisters here with my colleague, Toronto sommelier, Kimberly Pollock. Uh, I do want to remind everybody, if you're tasting along with us, and I certainly hope you are, you're welcome to add, leave your comments and your questions. But please do enjoy responsibly. On behalf of the LCBO and our trade partners, we want to encourage you to drink responsibly and enjoy responsibly, but also we're making it easier for you to do so with the new, or rolled out once again, home delivery. Hello, love home delivery. Also, they have a fantastic curbside pickup. You type in your order in the morning, and a couple hours later, you'll get an email confirming that your order has been packed and you just swing by the LCBO and you pick it. I mean, obviously the one that you not can't be any LCBO. I should probably preface that. It can't just be wherever you want. You've got to pick the exact store of which there are 190. So there are no shortages of that. But uh, you just pick up whatever you need, whatever you've ordered and already paid for. It's right there. It's brilliant. It's easy. You're in, you're out. It's such a great service. They do such a good job with that. We do have a question from Vivian Kimberly. And it says, she's asking how different are Gewürztraminers from Germany than those of France? And we see a lot of uh, Gewürztraminers coming out of Alsace, which was once Germany, uh, sort of has flip-flopped across that border a few times over the centuries. But um, so that would mean that 
What do you think? Um, I think it's, I think it's an interesting comparison. I think what you can get from trying the Gewurz demeanor between Germany and France um, is a sense uh, of place of the terroir of the different regions. Uh, stylistically, from what I've experienced, I think the ones in Germany um, can be a little bit, a little bit drier, just a little bit kind of earlier harvested to maintain a bit more of that freshness. Uh, whereas the the French, um, the French ones I've had tend to to really go all in for that opulence. Um, but really, they they share they share a lot in common when it comes to the flavor profiles. A lot of similarities for sure. And Gewurztraminer really is one of those white wines that is very distinct. If you're ever doing a sommelier exam uh, and you get a Gewurztraminer in the lineup that you have to pick out blind, you're kind of like, hallelujah, hallelujah. I know this one. I know this one. I might just pass. Um, oh, I should be. I've just stood corrected. The LCBO no longer does curbside pickup. What it does is same day pickup. So you do have to go into the store and there's going to usually be a demarcated counter or something like that. That's right available on their website. There's 190 stores that do it. It's no longer curbside. It is still, but it is same day. So I misspoke a little bit there. Sorry. And thank you for the correction. Um, okay. So we are rounding this out. We are rounding this out with a red wine. Okay. Look at this sexy label. This is from Baden as well, still in that gorgeous South. We've got, it's sort of to me, it sort of straddles the border between traditional and modern. So we've got this gorgeous black and gold label, very sleek, very well spaced out, very easy to read. It says Pinot Noir, not the uh, Germanic word for Pinot Noir, which is Spade for Gunder, but it still embraces the Trocken. It says that right on the label. And of course, <laughs> the name of the winery. Do you care to attempt this, Kimberly? I will take this one. All right, so this winery is Königshafthauser Steinbubel. Once again, I'm sorry for the people in the back. Uh, Königshafthauser Steinbubel. And, and sorry, once more, really quick. Uh, Königshafthauser Steinbubel. I love your accent there. You sound like my aunt, for God's sakes. My, my grandparents came out of Austria, so it's a slightly different um, part of the language, but uh, same roots. <laughs> same idea. Yes. Well, yeah. My my mom's my mom was born in Germany, and her her side of the family, my side of the my, my mom's side of the family, is German. And uh, I used to speak fluent German. I probably can pick it up again here and there. But when I moved home from Germany, my mom made fun of my accent, and I've never spoken it again. Well, that's a lie. I just don't speak it with her. And then. That's a, that's a story for a glass of wine and a therapist couch. We won't get into it now. Um, okay, so another question for you. This is a Pinot Noir from Germany. Ready for a quiz, Kimberly? Yes, always. Okay, let's see if you can do it. It's a tough one. I don't know if you can. Germany on the world production of Pinot Noir. Is it number one in the world? Is it number three in the world? Or is it number seven in the world? All uh, you know, I, I remember when I found this out, I was, I was really surprised, um, but it is, is the third largest in the world. Third largest, yeah, thir third largest Pinot Noir producer in the world, in der Welt. Yeah, um, I always, um, I think that took me su by surprise because um, you see so many Pinots from New Zealand and from Australia here, uh, whereas the, the German ones have always kind of taken a back seat here, which makes me even more happy and excited to see the LCBO bringing in examples like this that really do show you the potential of the grapes there. I think this is a fantastic Pinot Noir and really it's the most expensive of our flight at 1895, but when you compare it against other Pinot Noirs, you know, dollars and dollars and dollars less than other Pinot Noirs. It's really worth giving it a try. I love the smokiness that comes through on this glass. I love that, uh, you know, perfumed raspberry note that comes through on this glass. Again, we're, I sound like I'm beating a dead horse, but you know, that acidity, again, Pinot Noir, we've been talking so long about the Riesling and the acidity making it food friendly, but Pinot Noir is one of the most food friendly reds that there is, again, because of that lower tannin, and that higher acidity that offers a lot of, uh, a lot of food flexibility from white meats like turkeys and chickens and even salmons, right through to things like filet mignons and prime ribs, and of course, brilliant with vegetarian options of mushrooms and eggplants and things like that. So it really does offer a lot of bang for its buck when you're looking at a food pairing option. Absolutely. And the bottle is so beautiful. You know, you bring this to a dinner party, it's just going to look fantastic on the table. Uh, I love that they haven't lost the complete sense of tradition there. They are kind of paying respect to that 
there is such an amazing winemaking tradition in Germany dating back to when the Romans passed through. Uh, and so, you know, it doesn't surprise me that all the wine, not all the wineries have completely modernized the look because, you know, that's a, a real history, history to be proud of. Of course. What I do like is that they're helping guide the North American market and the, uh, the North American wine lovers, giving it sort of that gentle guidance as you start to discover more and more. And what they've also done, and we'll get to this in just a second, because I don't want to end this segment without talking about the German wine queens. We will talk about this right after we talk about the, the food pairing for this wine. But I think it's just such a great opportunity to see a real education and an ambassadorship. And I think it's it's well worth a, a quick conversation about that. So when we're talking about this Pinot Noir and all of the foods it could go with, once again, food and drink, hitting it out of the park, totally unexpected pairing, I think, but one that I can see working brilliantly. Here we've got wood grilled pork with honeyed fennel and apple. And I can just see how brilliant this is, right? So pork often being that the other white meat, uh, often really juicy if it's cooked correctly. Um, but we've got all of those fruity flavors with it. And I think it's great. I love what you were saying before when we were chatting about how basically you're, you're looking at pairing this like you would a sauce. Absolutely. I think uh, whenever I approach a pairing, I think um, about an element that would go well with the dish um, kind of in its actual food form. And so many times we're pairing kind of fruit sauces or fruits, in this case, the apples uh, with pork. And so when you have a wine that has a great fruit character to it, um, it makes natural sense to go together. No, it's absolutely gorgeous. I think it's definitely, and what I like about it as well, again, that 10 minute chill in the fridge or in the ice bucket, brilliant for summertime. You know, you can see somebody doing something over the, the charcoal grill or, you know, you've got something on a cedar plank, but just really easy, elegant, entertaining. And we talk about that quite a bit, you know, the uh, food, I talk about that, sorry, quite a bit. Like when we're looking at pairing wines for our guests or, or our clients, especially when it comes to larger backyard gatherings, now that we've, you know, we're all double vaxxed or most of us are double vaxxed and we're fingers crossed well on our way to getting a lot more things reopened. And, and you know, we have these backyard parties uh, or these garden parties or these outdoor parties, uh, obviously with certain rules and regulations in place. But, you know, you when you have so many people over, you don't necessarily always want to be breaking the budget. So I always look for food friendly, ding. I look for crowd friendly, ding. And I look for wallet friendly, ding, ding, ding. Ding! I think that is is all of these wines are just absolutely brilliant for uh, summertime entertaining. I completely agree. I think the price on them is kind of outstanding. Uh, it really gives you an option to to try a few of them uh, and really experiment when it comes to what you want to eat with them. Absolutely. Now, what's cool when we talk about learning a little bit more, which of course is what these LCBO segments are all about, um, I do want to bring up the, the the German wine queens because in Ontario, in North America, here's a beautiful picture of these. Uh, aren't they just fabulous? Uh, we always associate, you know, the word queen with beauty pageants. So Miss Universe, Miss Canada, whatever the case might be. But this isn't the case when it comes to the German wine queen. It's a decades old tradition that actually is deeply rooted in very serious education. So of the 13 wine regions in Germany, each wine region will uh, elect a couple of contenders to then go to the, the, the national stage where these women have worked really hard. Typically they come from winemaking families, uh, agency families, maybe they have some, some sort of pol political, so they know the landscape very well, but they, it's, a, it's, it's a very intensive process of exam writing and then answering live questions in front of a panel of judges to, under, to prove that you know, or they know, uh, the grapes that Germany grows, the terroir that Germany has, the styles of wine, and then whoever is elected, what a cool job, they get to go around the world and educate people on German wine. I think it's, it's an amazing kind of ambassadorship program to really help the world better understand German wine. Uh, I think it's quite unique. I've never heard of another wine region um, putting this much effort into finding someone who they can trust and stand behind as an expert in their wines, who then gets to, to go around and share that joy and that knowledge with the world. Yeah, it's great, especially because so many wine consumers and wine lovers are getting so much more savvy, whether it be tuning into the LCBO's YouTube channel, which we're doing right now, or watching a food network or reading a wine magazine like the food and drink or any other kind of magazine. So many people are are going beyond and they're interested in traveling through a glass and experimenting more. So it's a great program to, to really learn it. And I know that 
you know, prior to the to the pandemic, we would see the German wine queen show up in Toronto quite a bit. So it was at least once a year, which is quite a bit. So it was really it was really quite fun. Okay, so I think what we're doing is we're going to wind this down. And I had a great time. What about you? I had a fantastic time. Yeah. Uh, I do want to thank all of you for watching. Uh, if you are watching this on replay, don't feel like you can't leave us a comment or a question. We will be checking in every once in a while and making sure that we answer you, whether that be Kimberly or me or the intrepid staff at the LCBO, somebody will be sure to get back to you. But in the meantime, Kimberly, if somebody wants to follow you along and see what you're getting up to, maybe get in contact, how, where do they find you? How do they stay in touch? Um, so they can always follow me and reach out over Instagram. Uh, just my name, Kimberly Polak, no spaces or anything in between. I'm always uh, doing my best to, to keep in touch and contact with people. Uh, and I love talking about wine. German wine is, you know, really dear to my heart. But uh, if you have any questions, I'm always happy to answer them. Uh, and don't forget to visit me at Azar at 96 Ossington Avenue uh, if you want a little meal to go along with your Riesling. Oh, fantastic. I'm going to be doing that for sure. I'm so excited. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. My name is Erin Henderson. I am the founder and chief sommelier at the Wine Sisters. You can follow us on Instagram. It's the Wine Sisters. There are underscores between the words. Uh, long story about how that happened, but I'm blaming it on my sister. But anyway, you can follow us there. We do our best to give you daily interesting content, or you can even go to our YouTube channel, the Wine Sisters, where once a week we drop a new video that teaches you all about eating, drinking, and entertaining like a pro. But in the meantime, if you have enjoyed these wines or if something has piqued your interest, it is available at the LCBO. You can order it straight to your home, or you can go do same day pickup. That means type it in, order it on your computer in the morning, and a couple hours later, you'll get an email from whatever store you ordered it from saying it's ready for pickup, and that's it. It's super easy. No fuss, no muss, no waiting in line. It's a terrific service. So, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the wines, uh, the wine sisters, on behalf of the LCBO and our trade partners, thank you so much for joining us. Please enjoy responsibly. We will see you again soon, and until we do, stay well and drink better. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everyone.